Hello everyone, can you hear me? No, it works now. It works if you turn it on, apparently. Hey, welcome guys. Uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, we're going to start now. Uh, hopefully there'll be some more people coming as well. But uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, containers. How many of you are familiar with containers and the concept of containers? Excellent, okay. So some of you may already know some of what I'm going to talk about. Others, it may be completely new to you. And we're also going to talk vaguely about the Google Cloud Platform, but there's very, very little stuff in here about Google Cloud Platform specifically. The demo at the end that I'm going to do uh, runs on Google Cloud Platform, but we're not going to talk about anything to do with Google Cloud Platform today. So thank you uh, for coming to the talk today. Uh, it's great to be back in Rome. I was here two years ago in this very room uh, for one of my first cloud talks because I joined the cloud team at the start of 2013. Uh, so it's been a couple of years now. Uh, my name is Mandy Waite. I am a developer relations engineer or developer advocate, as it says on my sleeve. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at TechGirl. And we have my Twitter handle on every slide. <laughs> so if you forget it, you can, if I say anything offensive, you can look up my Twitter handle and, and quickly tweet about it, which is pretty cool. In terms of the agenda, uh, this is a very short talk. It's only 40 minutes. So we only have about 30 minutes of effective talking. So I'm, I've had to truncate some of this talk uh, and not go into all of the detail I wanted to. So uh, we're going to focus very heavily on the demo at the end. So we're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about containers specifically at Google. We're going to talk about Docker. Uh, and we're going to talk about, well, we're going to show you a demo, a demonstration of some of this stuff working. Uh, I should mention Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not on my list. Uh, we're going to talk about Kubernetes because this is a talk about Kubernetes. So let's talk about containers. So some of you put your hands up and I asked you uh, if you're familiar with what containers were. Uh, so for those of you that aren't or are new to the paradigm, ah, feedback. You need to give feedback. You can give feedback by scanning this QR code uh, or you can find the URL down the bottom if your camera fails to be able to grab that QR code. Uh, your feedback is really, really useful to make these sessions better. So please, please uh, go to this uh, this uh, URL, this QR code, and give me some feedback. Uh, let's talk about containers. Uh, what is a container? So uh, the first line isn't very technical. Uh, a lightweight environment for running applications doesn't tell us a huge amount about what a container is. Uh, but that's one of the important aspects of it, and it's one of the key plays for it. Uh, anybody remember static binaries back in the days before dynamic linking? OK, <laughs> not many of you. OK, I'm old enough to remember static binaries. Uh, Back in the old days, we used to compile uh, our applications and pull in all of the binary code that we needed to support it, all of the library code. So if we had a static, we, we were building a binary that had a dependency on, say, OpenSSL or pcree or some other library. Uh, at compile time, we would pull in all of those binary, all of that binary content, and put it into our binary, uh, the binary we generated, which meant when we ran that binary, in some environment, we wouldn't have to worry about the operating system providing those libraries for us, uh, because it was all encapsulated within the actual binary itself. So providing the actual architecture of the binary, uh, whether it's uh, I386, AMD64, uh, Darwin, uh, providing the architecture was correct, it would run, uh, because the dependencies were, ex were, there were no external dependencies, everything was internal. Uh, hermetically sealed in terms of the fact that you're really not required to actually SSH into these things, these containers that are running your applications. It's possible, but these things live and die very, very quickly. And actually SSH into one isn't particularly meaningful, particularly when you get into scheduling and uh, doing clusters of these things, which we'll talk about later. Uh, also, isolation is extremely important. Uh, we've all experienced one application on one machine uh, impacting the performance of another application when on the same machine. Uh, so one machine would peg the CPU, would hog all of the memory, would throttle the disk, effectively breaking all of the applic other applications that were running around it. Uh, containers provide a level of isolation, so we can provide isolation at the level of resources. Uh, we can say specifically how much CPU a container or a process can have. We can say specifically how much CPU, uh, how much memory, how much disk I.O. We can also provide a 
separate and unique view of the entire machine, the entire operating system, in terms of users, in terms of file system, and in terms of network. We can map all of those so that it has its own specific view. And it feels for itself that it's the only thing that's actually running on this machine. Ultimately, this moves us from a notion that we have with hypervisors, where we run virtual machines, of having an idealized piece of hardware in which we can run lots of different virtual machines, moving up the stack to having a piece of idealized operating system on which we can run containers. And we'll explore that further. Containers are made possible by from some uh, technologies, specifically uh, the, uh, part of the Linux kernel, uh, some that Google have been involved in. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, uh, but it's interesting to actually look these up and find out more about them. Uh, C groups effectively allow us to do this resource isolation, to specify we want uh, this container or this process to have X amount of CPU or memory or disk I.O. Namespaces effectively change the view uh, of uh, the running process or the container so that it thinks it's the only thing that's running on the machine. We can also control capabilities at a very fine-grained level now with role-based access control and capabilities. So can this process do a certain thing on the operating system? That's all role-based and, and capability-based. And we go back to the days when we had Cheroots, where we could actually say, for a running application, this was its root within the file system. Right? And for it, while it's running, that looked like the root, uh, the actual root directory of uh, the file system to it. Why should developers care? Uh, so the first thing is it provides a static application environment. So when we're talking about things like Docker and other container runtimes, maybe Rocket in the future, uh, it provides an application environment uh, that's consistent everywhere. Uh, if you think about the Java virtual machine, it's very similar, like, uh, very similar to that. You run your Java virtual machine, many, many different places, lots of different machines, lots of different platforms, and you can run your Java code on top of it without change. Uh, so containers effectively give you exactly the same for that, for uh, a different format of runtime. Uh, so this leads to extremely reliable deployments. Uh, you have the same runtime everywhere. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about the fact you're running on a Mac OS today or a virtual machine tomorrow or somewhere else. And we have happy dogs, ultimately, for that. And I'm not sure what the happy dog is there for, but he seems very happy. We also have a uh, repeatable and runnable artifact. So once we create a container image, uh, something that actually represents a running container, uh, we can use that image anywhere. So we go to the runtime that we have, which runtime we have anywhere, and we can say, this is my image, run this for me, and it will run the same everywhere we run it. So if our test environment is, or if our development environment is our Mac, o Mac laptop, and our production environment is a virtual machine in the cloud, we don't care anymore. We have an image, it will run exactly the same on my Mac as it will run in the cloud. Uh, so all the way through from development to test uh, to production, we can get exactly the same experience when running that application. And that's extremely important. Also, because these uh, containers can be loosely coupled, it's very easy to build uh, composable applications from them, so things like micro microservices. And that also facilitates reuse. So when you build a service, you can uh, make a microservice instead of building something big into a, a, a major application and then share that across other applications to use. Need a drink of water. So we're going to skim through these slides fairly quickly. Uh, this is what the virtual machine looked like. We had a piece of idealized hardware at the hypervisor level. And we have a guest OS running on it. And all the green stuff is your stuff. The libraries you need to run the application and your application code. Effectively, though, the libraries are likely to be provided by the operating system. So you're going to be doing a, a dynamic linking at runtime. These libraries will be pulled in dynamically. And there may be some effects if you're having multiple applications run not on the same virtual machine. The library dependencies and the library requirements may be different between these two applications, and that can cause you some problems. Uh, so we have this uh, lack of isolation between these two individual applications running. Uh, they each have their own dependencies. Those dependencies, if they're changed or updated in any way, could impact the other, the other running application. And at the same time, this application here could hog all of the CPU. It could hog all of the memory. It could pull down the machine, effectively taking down the other application as well. So no isolation. We also have little reuse, because the model allows us to say, this is a uh, an idealized piece of hardware. We can run multiple virtual machines on it, which is great, because now we have isolation again. So we have our application code, 
uh, running on a virtual machine. So we have individual applications running on their own virtual machines. But now we've uh, gathered some redundancy. Now we have multiple versions of the guest operating system running, uh, which is likely to be Red Hat or Ubuntu or Fedora or Windows or something fairly heavyweight. And that's completely redundant because we don't really need it. All we want to do is run our application code with its dependencies. So containers effectively give us a better abstraction layer. So everything above the line is what you care about. And that's the only thing you should have to care about. You shouldn't have to worry about spinning up virtual machines to run this stuff. You should just have a container runtime on which you can run it. And so ultimately we have the hypervisor, we have a node OS. Now we're talking in terms of node. Uh, I could just call this a guest OS. It's the same as before on the previous slide. Uh, but we're now we're going to start thinking in terms of nodes and clusters of machines on which we can run containers. I want to kind of introduce that concept fairly early. The idea of a node being different from uh, an individual machine. And on top of this, we're running three containers. So these container one, container two, container three, they all have their application code and they all have their library dependencies all bundled together. So these things are fully encapsulated. There are no external dependencies. So they also have, potentially, uh, resource limitations as well provided to them. So they can, this one could have uh, two cores, uh, six gigs of RAM. This one could have four cores, two gigs of RAM, et cetera, et cetera. Effectively, meaning this application couldn't steal RAM or CPU time away from the other uh, running applications. And the actual full version of this talk has, goes into this in a lot more detail. And I'd love to talk about it today, but maybe we can point you to some slides uh, and a video that you can look at later. So anyway, so now we have this notion of an idealised operating system. We've moved up the stack from idealised hardware to idealised operating system. Okay, so don't forget Twitter, <laughs> feedback. Right, okay, how are we doing so far? Everybody with me? Anybody not with me? Any burning questions that you need to ask? That's a good question, but it's going to take a while to explain. So if you want to talk to me afterwards, Bill, I can talk to you okay. and answer your question one by one. It'll probably take too long. And I, I, I'm kind of really worried that I'm going to miss out on my demo at the end, which I really want to do. So okay. I'll talk to Sorry. me afterwards. Okay. No, 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 don't worry. It's fine. I, I don't think it's going to stop you from understanding. Okay. Uh, so uh, if it was something like, oh, my God, I have no idea what you're talking about, then uh, that would have been fine. But uh, I think we're almost on the same page. Uh, containers at Google. Uh, so... Uh, everything at Google runs in a container. Everything. <laughs> really, literally everything runs in a container. Okay, so I went to a data center recently and there are some machines that probably are supplied by external vendors that don't run containers. Uh, but everything that we do runs in a container. That's Gmail, your web searches, every time you use Google to do a search, uh, maps, things like that, all run in containers. When we run a map produce, and when we run a batch job, it runs in a container. Uh, Google File System and Google File System version 2, which is called Colossus, they run in containers. Our virtual machines for Google Compute Engine run in containers, and they have nanny processes that are running in containers managing them, that everything runs in a container. And we'll talk about why that's important to us in a minute. We like containers for these following reasons, and some of these, I'm also going to dive into these in more detail. Uh, I'm not going to go into them because it's going to take too long to explain them and I want to get into that demo. So performance, repeatability, isolation we've already covered, uh, quality of service, the prioritization, the ability to say this thing is more important than this thing, uh, setting service level objectives for individual processes and applications, uh, to the ability to do accounting, uh, visibility and portability, uh, things we've already covered already. And Google internally uh, have a cluster management stack. So we've already talked about containers. We've introduced the notion of containers. Uh, but Google runs containers, everything in a container. So how do we do that? 
we just like take a machine, spin up a container, uh, one Docker and spin up a container, or do we do something else? So we do something else, and basically we have, on every machine, we have lots of machines. I have no idea how many machines we have. I used to know, but I don't know anymore. And I couldn't tell you if I did, but we have a lot of machines. And each one of them has this blue configuration, a managed base operating system and a node container manager. Every one of them has that. The container manager runs containers. This is something like Docker, but it's not Docker. It's something different. We don't run Docker internally. We have our own scheduler, our own node container manager. So containers run here. Uh, but how do the containers get onto a particular machine? What we want to really not happen is that an engineer will say, I want to run this, and I'm going to run it in this data center, on this rack, on this machine in this rack. We don't want that at all. What we want him to do is say, I, want, I have this thing I want to run. I want X of them. I want six replicas. I want X amount of CPU. I want uh, X amount of RAM and disk I.O. Go ahead and run this for me. So what he does, or she does, they create a configuration file and they pass it onto the cluster scheduler, our cluster scheduler. And it says, OK, I will work out where to run that for you. And it will try to make the best use of prioritization, uh, amount of CPU available, RAM available, and everything else to efficiently prioritize resources for us, uh, for all of these processes. And every engineer is doing that. So effectively, they don't care where it's running. They may have sometimes have restrictions on which data center they have to run in, but mostly they don't care where it runs. Uh, so the cluster scheduler takes care of taking all of our containers and scheduling them for us. Now, what we're trying to do is actually help everybody move towards that kind of model, where you have something you want to run, and you say to something, run this for me. And that would be a great world. And I think that's the world we're going to be, well, the, the world we're heading towards very rapidly over the next few years. So at some point, you will see this. You'll say, I want to run this. You'll say to something, run it for me, and it will run it for you. So let's talk about Docker. But we, we don't generally talk much about Docker in these talks. How many of you know or are familiar with Docker? OK. So some people think Docker and containers are the same thing, which they are, really. But some people just kind of conflate Docker to be containers. Uh, Docker is a container format. And Google Trends shows us this is the rise in popularity of Docker over the last few years. Uh, since really effectively the early, early months of June 2014, going back into 2013, Docker has risen dramatically in terms of trends. But this doesn't really mean much to you because we don't have a y-axis. So, so this could be nothing, right? But so how many of you are familiar with Fernando Alonso? Formula Formula One driver. OK, not many of you. He, he's not Italian, but he did drive for Ferrari. Yeah. Right. So, so this is how he compares uh, with Docker. So this is Fernando's, Fernando's popularity compared with Docker. So you can see at some point, Docker became more popular than Fernando Alonso. <coughs> Until Fernando Alonso had a big crash a few weeks ago, when he became much more popular than Docker. So maybe Docker should have a big crash as well. So anyway, that gives you some, that gives you some context about it. I, I could have done Silver, Silver, uh, Bellasconi, whatever his name is. I could have done somebody like that, somebody famous, but uh, I don't know that many famous Italians because I don't live here. So I, I would have probably offended everybody if I picked the wrong name. So I went for somebody safe. I, I like Formula One, so that's a good choice for me. And we're just, we're not going to get into the details of what Docker is. Uh, we're just going to go over a quick kind of pricey of what it is compared to a, the containers we've talked, to, talked about so far. Now, Docker is effectively an implementation of this container idea, this notion of containers. And it's a very, very popular uh, implementation. It's the most popular, and it's setting the standard and setting the way forward for everything in the future. It's also effectively a package format. This is one of the reasons for its success. It has a very, very simple package format. It has a repository, a public repository, the ability to store packages in, t in form of images within a repository for easy access and for easy sharing. Uh, the actual format of the images themselves is built on a union file system up in layers, and it's really, really effective. They are also an ecosystem. So because Docker, Docker is so popular, lots of tools are popped up around it. Uh, and that will continue to happen as they continue to gain momentum. There will be more and more tools. 
uh, more and more uh, environments in which it can run. Uh, Docker is also a company, uh, and they therefore have a financial responsibility. Uh, so people are actually investing money in that company. They are hugely popular open source. I won't necessarily say a juggernaut. They have 25,000 stars on GitHub. And for context, I think Bootstrap has 70,000 stars, but Bootstrap is way out there for some reason. Uh, so I don't know why that is, but it's also a phenomenon. It's extremely popular, as you saw from the trends. Uh, Fernando Alonso is extremely popular as well. So uh, uh, he's a phenomenon, and so is Docker. And Docker effectively does exactly what we want. We have a container image that has our dependencies and our application code. And it also provides a runtime environment, which we can install on Linux machines. Uh, we can install via some trickery on uh, Windows and Mac OS machines. Uh, Ultimately, we'll have native versions of these running on Mac and on Windows. Uh, that's some trickery involved in that as well, but Docker can run pretty much everywhere. And now, we want to get into talking about orchestrating or scheduling. I have to use the word orchestrating because that's the buzzword currently going around the container, in the container world. Orchestration. I don't know why orchestration was chosen. Uh, scheduling sounds much better to me. Anyway. We should have a vote. Uh, you should tweet me and say which one you prefer, uh, uh, orchestration or uh, scheduling. So we have lots of options. Docker have recently introduced uh, a, a cluster management, uh, an orchestration tool called Docker Swarm. Uh, Spotify have one, believe it or not. They have one for Docker containers called Helios. Uh, CoreOS, who are changing the game by having their own container format called Rocket, uh, which may take off like a rocket, ultimately. Uh, they have something called Fleet, and we also have Kubernetes. So how many of you have heard of Kubernetes? Okay, how many of you know what Kubernetes means? This is a big test. You know what it means? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that on the next slide. I should give you a prize. Are you around tomorrow? Are you... Uh, <laughs> I didn't bring any swag. We had the Firebase Code Lab tomorrow, and I was going to use the swag for that. So Kubernetes, uh, I'm going to quickly spin up a cluster. Uh, so I want to spin up a container cluster. So I'm going to do that now. Move it up a bit so you can see it. Okay, so now I'm going to create a cluster. And I'm doing this ahead of time because it's going to take a little bit of time for it to complete. It's going to go away and create a four-node cluster of machines for us, uh, which is fully uh, set up to run in and scheduling containers. And there's a lot of things that need to work properly for this demo to work. So I could fail dramatically here. And I often do. <laughs> I'm hoping in this case I won't fail. I've done this enough times now not to. So Kubernetes, and yes, uh, uh, points for... Uh, uh, it means helmsman of a ship. Uh, and I think governor is a better word for it, so it's the root of the word governor. I think it kind of makes sense that a governor is somebody who's in charge of a ship, something that governs the ship. Uh, orchestrate, so we're getting back to that word orchestration. Orchestration for running Docker containers. Uh, it supports, ultimately, multi-cloud environments. At the moment, that means you can run it on uh, Microsoft Azure. You can run it on, you can run it on EC2. Uh, you can also run it on uh, Google Cloud Platform. You can run it on uh, various other uh, cloud platforms. Currently, you can run it various different places. Uh, Mesosphere support it. Uh, VMware support it. Pivotal support it. So it has a huge amount of support from major companies. Uh, and if you go to the Kubernetes links that we have at the end, you'll find a list of them. I used to have a list of them, but I don't keep it anymore. Uh, Multi-cloud, though, ultimately will mean that we can have a fleet of virtual machines, a fleet of machines that can, we can schedule containers on in different clouds. So we can have part of it in Google Cloud Platform, part of it in uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, EC2, part of it in Azure, and we can just say to the scheduler, schedule this for me, and we won't know where it's running. 
We won't know if it's running in Azure or AWS. We may be able to set some kind of metadata to say, uh, go for the cheapest. Uh, and that might work for you, and the prices may fluctuate. Uh, this isn't what we do internally. This isn't our uh, cluster scheduler that we kind of saying, here you are, have our cluster scheduler. Uh, but it is inspired and informed by what we've done so far with our cluster scheduler uh, and our internal systems. It's completely open source. It's written in the Go language, Go programming language. And effectively, we have this paradigm of managing applications, not managing machines. Machines, there's this bad thing called uh, pets versus cattle, which I really don't like, about virtual machines being cattle and your server next to your desk being your pet. It has a name, and cattle don't have names. They have, like, numbers. Uh, but I'm a vegetarian, and I have ethical concerns about the way we treat cattle, so it doesn't really play very well with me. Uh, key concepts, we have a cluster, which is a group of nodes. Remember, we use that word node, uh, on which containers are scheduled. We have a container, which we've already talked about. We have a pod, and a pod is a grouping of tightly coupled containers. Uh, a replication controller, which is a loop that effectively moves where we are now towards, towards a state that we desire. And we'll go into that in more detail. It's also a service. Uh, allows us to create a set of pods uh, that will work together in order to service our needs. Uh, this could be like a bunch of Nginx machines or uh, Redis workers, uh, those, that kind of thing. Labels, which are the only grouping mechanism within Kubernetes. Effectively, this is identifying metadata, which you can attach to everything within Kubernetes, uh, or including all the things we have in this list. Then we have a selector, which is something we can use to select uh, objects based on their labels. This is what a Kubernetes cluster looks like. I didn't. There's not a huge amount of imagination went into this picture, uh, but I just wanted to introduce the fact that we are running on a cluster here. Uh, we have five, six nodes, maybe a hundred nodes going out this way. The idea of a pod, a pod is a small group of containers and shared volumes. So we have containers grouped together uh, logically and probably tied together by their own life cycle. So it doesn't make one sense for one to exist without the other. In this case, we have a content management system file puller and a web server. The file puller will pull stuff in from the CMS, which will be served by the web server. Uh, the file puller doesn't exist without the web server, and the web server doesn't exist without the file puller. And it could effectively. But they share data through a shared volume. So they are tightly coupled. They're effectively the atomic unit of cluster scheduling. Uh, they share a namespace. They have IP addresses. Uh, effectively, I, I meant to fix this bullet point because it doesn't really make sense. They have IP addresses that are addressable in the network. So Docker has its own mechanism for doing network addressing uh, using a Docker bridge, but in Kubernetes, they, each one gets its own IP address, uh, and its IP address is the same one I see. The same one it sees is the same one I see. These things are ephemeral. They can come and go. We don't care about them that much. We care that they are running. We care we have X number of them running, but we don't care which one it is. Uh, they can come and go as they please. They can be torn up and uh, 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 set up and torn down very quickly. Labels themselves are very simple uh, key value pairs that are assigned to objects. Uh, in this case, we have a say, potentially app equals FE label attached to some of our pods, and an app equals V2 label attached to another pod. Uh, V2 is obviously version 2 of a pod. Uh, it's probably V2 of the FE pod. And then we can build dashboards up with selectors that will actually show us some information about those pods. So we're effectively grouping those pods by their labels. Uh, and this is uh, the membership of the group. It's the only grouping mechanism. Uh, it means we can build these dashboards and queryable by selectors. And they're also used by replication controllers and services, which we'll see shortly. A replication controller is effectively responsible for managing the desired state that we want. So it creates pods and it destroys pods as needed. And we have a good demonstration of that shortly. In this case, we have two replication controllers and they manage by labels again, the only grouping mechanism we have. So we have two V1 pods and one V2 pod. They have their own replication controllers. And we have this notion of desired state. So for replication controller one, we have desired state is two pods. For this one, we only have desired state equals one pod. They are responsible for maintaining that desired state. And I'm going to go straight into this part. 
So in this case, we have a bunch of pods, uh, four pods running on different nodes. Uh, and our desired state is four. We want four of these pods. We have four currently, so we're good, right? But what happens if that happens? So a lightning strike, something like that, uh, hits the data center, something tragic happens. Uh, one of my friends built coffee on his laptop this morning. <laughs> something tragic happens and one of these pods goes away. So now we have desired state equals four. Oh, oh yeah. So desired state equals four, current equals four. We go down to this where we only have three running. So now the replication controller kicks in. It's a loop. It's constantly looking and checking to make sure that we have the right number, that we have the desired state. And it will, use a, using a template that it understands, a container template, uh, a, a template for containers and for pods, it will create a new pod to replace the one that's missing. So now we're back to a situation where we have four and we want four. But perhaps what happened really was that the top of rack switch uh, got damaged, rebooted for some reason, came back up again, and suddenly we have our node two back again, and we have five pods now. So the replication controller will say, ah, we have five pods. I will kill one of them off. And so it goes back and kills one of them, but it could kill any of them. It could be any. Uh, there is no ordinality. There's, there's no idea that one of these pods is better than the other. When we get into more co complicated scheduling, then it may make intelligent decisions about where it's best to place that pod. Uh, it may have a machine that's completely free, or it may have a specific requirement in terms of memory that's only suitable on a specific machine. Then we have services, uh, which is a group of pods that effectively act as one. Uh, so this is defined by a, a, a selector. And effectively what we have is a client wants to access a service that we expose through a bunch of pods. So these pods are all the same. They could be a web server or an Nginx or something like that. Or they could be a Redis, uh, a Redis workers, a pool of Redis workers. And when we create the service, uh, we get a stable virtual IP, a VIP, and a port. <coughs> the access policy for passing traffic to the backend pods is based on load balancing for now. But we have different, uh, different ways of managing that, different access policies uh, in the pipeline. And again, this is all covered in the documentation. In terms of service discovery, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they should be stateless, yeah. So I think that's the paradigm nowadays anyway. That people have moved from storing state within their runtimes to storing them in databases. So things like Redis and Cassandra make that really easy. Redis particularly is really, really good for that. So, so in terms of service discovery, we also get a DNS name. So now we get this thing called Sky DNS. It will give us a D DNS name uh, that clients can use to discover your service. Obviously, they can't find out your IP address, so you need to be able to publish the DNS name. Uh, the rest of it is detail. So we have a constituency... Uh, we have X number of pods based on the selector here uh, that make up our service. We have this thing called a cube proxy, which I'm not going to get into, that manages the constituency and will be updated when anything changes in the back end. So anything can change here, and it won't change the actual IP address that's assigned to the uh, service. Uh, so I'm going to do the demo very shortly. So Kubernetes status currently, uh, it was open source back in June 2014 uh, at the first Docker comp. Uh, it was given an award called the Black Duck Rookie of the Year. Uh, and we also had this thing called Sea Advisor as well, which also received the same award. And Sea Advisor is for monitoring uh, containers. Uh, we've also launched Google Container Engine, which is a managed version of Kubernetes. So if you want service levels uh, with your Kubernetes cluster, if you don't want to have to manage it yourself, uh, Google provide a managed version of Kubernetes in the form of Google Container Engine. And we have a roadmap document. The documentation on the Kubernetes website is superb. If you want to find out anything about it, go and read it. But read it regularly because it changes often. Uh, until we get to 1.0, when we get to 1.0, things will stabilize in some number of months. Uh, and then we should have be able to build very large clusters. We can't do all the great scheduling that we do within Google yet, but ultimately the aim will be to move towards that model. And ultimately to encourage everybody else uh, to uh, move towards this model of scheduling containers rather than running applications. And for that, I'm going to get into the demo. 
And I have a microphone in my hand. So how am I going to do a demo with a microphone in my hand? A uh, Google Container Engine. That's the only time I'm going to mention the Google product today. So let's build something. So very, very simple. All demos should be very simple, right? Uh, because they break anyway. <laughs> if they're going to break, it might as well be a simple application that breaks as well as a complicated one, right? So we have a guestbook application. We have uh, free containers, or pods in this case, uh, running our guestbook app. They're talking to Redis at the back end, Redis Workers, which has a Redis master. Uh, so by now, we should have a cluster. Oh, demo. Right, OK. So I'm going to have to pick the microphone up and put it down. So. OK, so we have a running cluster. Uh, you can't see all of it here, but we have three nodes. Three nodes? It used to be four nodes. There's only three nodes now. I don't know why. But we have this uh, cluster up and running called Guestbook. Uh, and it has an IP address. And I care about the IP address. So I'm just going to grab that. Why is it doing that? So basically, I need to do some proxying. I'm going to run a, a local web server uh, using a, uh, a, an application that we have called kubectl uh, that will give me a proxy to the API server running on my cluster. So I have this API server that's responsible. Oh, we're over time. Oh, we've got five minutes left. All right, OK. I said minus five minutes. I thought like, I'd done too much. OK, so we can run this visualization, uh, and that will be what we're going to use for the rest of this. So at the moment, we have uh, some containers that have been provided for us. There's more. Uh, this is the DNS service, effectively, running on our cluster. Uh, there are other services as well, but I've hidden them away. I thought the DNS service would be quite interesting, so I left it here. Uh, and because we are out of time, I'm going to run my script to actually set up the cluster. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. So basically, I'm going to run a script to actually set up a Redis master pod. Uh, and if I hit that now, uh, oh, it didn't work. It's interesting. What did I do wrong? Hold on a sec. Oh, create. <laughs> I should have done create, sorry. I'm panicking because I'm running out of time now. And I really want to show this. Oh, time is our worst enemy. So what we should see now is a Redis master pod. We have a Redis master pod. That's a pod. Uh, and the next thing to do is create a service. And I'm going to create a service. I'll quickly show you these files in a second uh, so you can get a feel for what they're like. And then we create a service. So now we have a service sitting in front of our Redis, uh, our Redis master. So now we can access that. We're not going to expose this externally through a, a forwarding rule on Google Cloud Platform. So this will only be accessible internally. Uh, and the next thing I'm going to do is create Redis Workers. But I'm going to use a replication controller this time. So I'm going to run that command, and that will create a replication controller with one pod. I'm telling it to say, use this template to create my, pod, uh, my pods, but only create one of them. Oh, no, Redis Workers 2, my guestbook one, I'm doing one. So I'm asking for two Redis Workers in this case. And I'm going to run a service. Do, 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 do. This is fun, it's working. I do like it when it works. Well, I should probably delete more than that. 
And now I have a service, and so now I have two services. I have one service sitting in front of our Redis workers, uh, managed by a replication controller, and one service in front of the Redis master. And to quickly wrap it up, We're going to run the guestbook part of it, which is the front ends running PHP. Uh, we're going to spin those pods up. Oh, hold on. Sorry about that, I had an extra bit in my code. So now we have a guestbook controller with one guestbook pod, and the final thing will be to run the, or create the service, which will sit in front of our guestbook application, and we'll expose it, as, uh, expose it to uh, external clients, effectively. Now on Google Container Engine, this actually creates a forwarding rule, a load balancing forwarding rule, which is externalized, which you can access externally. Uh, so once this is finished, we'll be able to access the application and actually use it. Uh, I think we're going to run out of time, so I'm probably going to skip that. But effectively now, we have the... Ah, that's created. We have the guestbook running. The last thing to do will be to do a quick resize and to add some more pods to say to the replication controller we want more pods. So now I'm going to issue a command to resize the, that uh, replication controller so we effectively have three of those pods. And that takes a while to kick in, and ultimately we have three. So that's our desired state now. We wanted to have three of them, so now we have three of them. Uh, Any time we can change that, uh, ultimately we'll be able to do this kind of thing dynamically. Uh, we'll be able to scale nodes, clusters out, and we'll be able to scale a number of pods as well. And to quickly wrap up in terms of other things you can do, We'll get these, sheds, these slides shared to you somehow. Uh, I have to get some, some of the graphics out of them. Uh, but Kubernetes is open source. Uh, we want your help. Uh, so go to kubernetes.io. Uh, it's also on GitHub. If you just search for Kubernetes, you'll be fine. Uh, there's also an IRC channel as well uh, on Freenode. And at Twitter, at Kubernetes.io. And also there's some local meetups as well. I did some checking around beforehand. Uh, so there's a Docker Roma meetup. Uh, it's not very big at the moment. So uh, if you're interested in participating in that, that'd be quite useful. And we also have these things called Google Developer Groups where we do talks on containers and such like from time to time. It covers all Google products, but uh, it, we often talk about containers there. So GDG Roma LAB, uh, you can find out more by going to there. And I think we ran out of time for questions, right? No time for questions? Are we done? Sorry? Well, right, okay. Any questions? Oh, don't forget to feedback. Feedback, right? Feedback. And tweet me. Okay, I mean, if you have any questions, we're pretty much out of time. Just send them as a tweet and I will answer them. Oh, oh, sorry. Hey. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right. Okay, I can help you that. So, basically, the replication controller will start any that disappear. So, if one goes away, the replication controller will say, "Ah, oh, I need four of these. I've only got three. It will start another one. But if you say, "I want to update my containers. I want to update update the pods with a different image, with a different uh, set of containers," or just make subtle changes to it, make major updates to it. You can do a rolling update. And that rolling update will effectively change each pod one by one. So it will take them down and replace them with a the new version. 
Uh, and that's very, very easy to do. It's a function built into Kubernetes already. I just didn't have time to demo it today, but it is a really impressive demo. So, yeah. It works on the um, load balancer component to uh, off the running. Uh, now, it, it, it's quite. I should really show a complicated architecture of how Kubernetes is laid out, but it's all done within Kubernetes. Uh, you issue the command to the Kubernetes API, it will take that command and pass it onto the various proxies, and it will update everything that way. Uh, so it doesn't play, it doesn't go external at all. It all stays within the Kubernetes cluster. Okay? okay. All right, thanks guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming today. Really, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of Code Motion. <laughs>